Okay, uh, good evening everybody. It's good to see uh, a good turnout, a lot of familiar faces here tonight. And welcome to this year's Anthony Hyman Memorial Lecture, which will be given by Dr. David Mansfield and entitled A State Built on Sand, How Opium Undermined Afghanistan. My name is Jonathan Goodhand and I'm in the Development Studies Department at SOAS. I'm a member of the Centre of Contemporary Central Asia and the Caucasus, the Centre of Cent uh, Contemporary Central Asia and the Caucasus, who are hosting this event tonight. And as many of you will know, this is an event that's been running annually um, that started in 2002. And it's an event which is about remembering and celebrating the life and the work of Anthony Hyman, a scholar of Afghanistan and Central Asia, who was a great friend and supporter of academics at SARS um, and of the center and also of the Journal of Central, of a Central Asian Survey that many of us remain closely involved with. And the, the lecture, the annual lecture, has become a significant annual gathering. We've attracted many of the key scholars who have defined the field of Afghan studies. It's also a coming together of old friends and colleagues who share a common attachment a commitment and a passion towards the, the country. Um, and before I introduce David, I'd just also like to say that we lost a great supporter of the events in December th last year, um, Henry Brownrigg, who died in December. Henry was a great friend of both Anthony and Hilary Hyman, and a man of very wide-ranging interests and considerable, considerable expertise in Asian art and culture, particularly of India and Indonesia. He was a great supporter of this lecture, from the beginning, and we'd like to send, um, extend our sympathies to his family, who, and some of whom we think are here tonight. So now to introduce David. Um, David, first of all, I would, I'd like to say that I'm very happy that this is the first time that we're going to be talking about the issue of drugs, something that is so central to Afghanistan's political economy and to the lives and livelihoods of a major part of Afghanistan's population. As, as many of you will know, there are few policy arenas in which there is such a mismatch between the evidence base and the dominant policy paradigm. As David himself has repeatedly written, policy narratives, narratives around drugs are based on patchy and politicized evidence and flawed assumptions about why Afghan communities are engaged in drug cultivation. Secondly, I'm very happy that it's David who's given this talk. I think we can very confidently say that there's no one else better qualified in the world to be talking about the complexities of drug production and counter narcotics policies in Afghanistan than David. He's now entering, he won't like me saying this, he's now entering his third decade of um, studying and doing field research on drugs in Afghanistan. He's been to Afghanistan every growing season since 1997. Um, often at great personal risk to himself and the researchers he works with. So he's got unrivaled credibility in challenging problematic data and policy myths about drugs. Over the years, he's produced a stream of very influential policy papers and articles. Through his research, his writing, his consultancy on drugs issues, he straddles the academic the policy and the policy communities. And he brings together analytical insights about drugs and also about the real world of counter narcotics institutions and policy making environments. Um, David and I have known each other for I think it's something like 17 years now and uh, against his better judgment Dave decides to embark on a PhD at SARS under my supervision um, and he somehow managed to do this alongside his day job and one of the kind of the products of this, it's not just of his PhD, um, but one of the products of it has been this, this groundbreaking book um, published by Hearst in 2015, wasn't it, or 2016? Or it was, I think it was last, actually, to end um, beginning of last year. Um, of um, and it's the title is the title of today's today's lecture. It's the defining study of drugs, livelihoods, and state building in Afghanistan. And the book teaches us many things, but perhaps one of the most important message is that we need to stop exceptionalizing and demonizing drugs. There's a need to reconnect it to embed it within the social context, the political context, um, the economic context in which drugs um, are grown and trafficked. He eschews the easy generalization and shows the complex amalgam of factors that influence the cultivation of drugs and counter narcotics policies in Afghanistan. So this is that David is gonna be talking about a state built on sand. He's gonna be talking for about 40 to 45 minutes. 
and then we'll open it up for questions um, and we'll finish at 7.30 and we'll continue the conversation in the reception just outside here. So welcome Dave, it's great to have you here. Thanks Jonathan. Um, yeah, there's, I j it's amazing he still speaks to me after me to earn my PhD, my failure to deliver on so many deadlines. But, uh, and it's even uh, more kind of him to invite me to do this. And, and thank you very much to Anthony Hyman's family for the honor of, of speaking here tonight. Um, and I suppose it's important that I, I do sort of introduce myself in, in different ways. Um, and some of the caveats to my book and, and the work that I've done and the work that I'm going to present here. Um, I've spent, as Jonathan says, too many years, far too many years looking into poppy cultivation. I, I, I started to, the longer I've been in Afghanistan and the more I've dealt with people in embassies and various other things, and they tell me how, why people grow opium, the more I realize just how slow I must be. Um, because there's so many simple explanations for poppy cultivation and changes in poppy cultivation that I'm not sure why I have spent 20 years doing it. So. Um, <coughs> so I, but I, I, I really, the work I've done has tried to look at how opium bans have been implemented um, in Afghanistan, from the Taliban ban of 2000-2001, <coughs> bans in Nangarhar under Hajjadin Mohammed and uh, Gulag Shirzai, uh, more recently Daesh in the upper areas of uh, Achin and um, uh, the southern districts of Nangarhar. Um, and as well, of, of course, the, the famous or infamous Helmand Food Zone of 2008 onwards. Um, but I've also looked at how these bans have affected lives and livelihoods of the rural population in Afghanistan, um, how that's played out in different kinds of space, different kinds of uh, socioeconomic groups. And then what I've also tried to understand through that prism of looking at these bans is what they tell us about political power and how it's articulated in rural Afghanistan, um, and subsequently what impact bans have on state building and conflict. And I think that's where things start to get quite interesting. So I'll offer a set of caveats to start with, because uh, just in case there's people in the room, they're always watching, you never know. First caveat, <coughs> more of a disclaimer, is that over the years I've worked for and in some cases, I continue to work for a number of organizations, some of whom may be here. ARE Youth, I worked for the Foreign Office for a number of years, GFID, Asian Development Bank, um, and the EC. And of course, many years ago, I think when myself and Anthony Fitzherbert first met, he look, doesn't look a day older, but uh, I look, well, I've got a lot less hair. Um, many years ago, UNODC. Um, I currently work for LSE. And I'd just like to be clear that what I say today is based on the empirical work that I've done and I'm not representing the views of any of these learned organizations. Thank you. Second caveat, I come at this issue from a development perspective. And the work I do is grounded in the conceptual framework and methodology of rural livelihoods and political economy. I avoid Doug's fetishism like the plague, the sort of obsession that everything can be defined by Farmers who grow or do not grow opium. Um, the idea that um, farms can be defined solely by whether they are poppy farmers or not poppy farmers, if you read the UNODC surveys. The reasons that farmers are engaged in opium production cannot be summed up on the basis of a single response to a direct question, as you'll find in many of those surveys. You often have uh, conclusions that X percent of farmers grow poppy because of the high price. Y percent grow it because of poverty. Z percent grow it because the need for credit, we never have, actually these, all, these aren't mutually exclusive who are sponsored, so why we have this, I do not know. You cannot sum up complex human behavior in a single categorized answer in that way. So I won't have much of that. This is far more complex. It makes for nice takeaways and headlines. We see it often in the media, but this isn't the reality of what's happening in rural Afghanistan. And then we also see drugs fetishism in the way CN and efforts to ban poppy are analyzed where the reasons for a ban are justified in terms of vested interests, to push up opium prices, the famous explanation of the Taliban ban, and make greater profits, the removal of competitors. Um, from my experience, many bans often shouldn't even be seen primarily as acts of drug control. There's a lot of theater around counter-narcotics. There's a lot of 
gamesmanship by all of us, not just Afghans, not just the Afghan government and authorities. So I encourage us to look beyond that theater of counter-narcotics and these kind of claims. And look at what farmers do. I use field work and imagery, um, but there are other ways to do that. Look at the agronomics of the crops. Is it even possible that a crop can grow at certain times of the year or in certain locations? Um, explore livelihood systems. How does poppy fit in with the wheat the, for the livestock and the household that the, the household and livestock eat? Um, and examine research methodologies. Because many present, um, many of the presentations we have that come from conventional narratives, uh, sorry, conventional wisdoms and, and uh, official narratives on drugs, just make little sense. We really need to be far more discerning as we look at the data that we're presented with and we look at the explanation. Because what you come up with is information that suggests anecdote and rumors are circulating as fact and recirculating with academic rigor because suddenly they're cited in a, a peer-reviewed journal. Examples might be bans that didn't happen, i.e. the Taliban ban of 94-95 and its subsequent rescinding of 96. I can't see any evidence that that took place. <laughs> None at all. But it's in the literature and it is commonly repeated. The introduction of Poppy to Central Helmand by Nassim Akhanzada who imposed poppy quotas on people at risk of torture and death. Why do you need to be encouraged to grow something that works? Why do you need to be threatened with torture and death? And did Nassim Akhanzada really have that kind of control? I'd also add the current claims, I'm talking to earlier with Anthony about this, around GMO Chinese seeds. You know, this is, these are the classic stories that we see that aren't based on an understanding around rural livelihoods, agronomic reality. So we need to dig into the detail and not take things as given, not see everything term in terms of drugs and drugs policy, drugs fetishism. We need to understand politics and economics and livelihoods. And these are critical to understanding what is really happening in rural Afghanistan, not just the, the narratives of the Taliban. The third caveat is that my, increase, my experience has become increasingly geographically focused within the country particular focus on Nangarhar and Helmand, where field work has been undertaken every six months in Nangarhar for 11 years, I think it is. And ev well, now we're slipping with to a year in Helmand, but ever since, well, most recently looking at the Helmand food zone since 2008. I did used to spend my years in delightful provinces like Gore uh, and Badakhshan, but those days are over. Um, Although when I was writing the, this book, I was deeply immersed in reviewing my footnote, my field notes from those times um, across a number of provinces. Um, and this was incredibly helpful in developing a greater understanding of what, in particular, the Taliban prohibition tells us about the projection of state power in Afghanistan and how bans since they should be under, how bans since then should be understood. They, all, they do, after all, have a lot in common. The tricks of the Taliban were ban were played out time and time again subsequently. The fourth caveat is that the fact that my geographic focus has become very concentrated in the last few years due to the security challenges of doing research in rural Afghanistan. In fact, my days of wandering around rural Afghanistan, eastern and southern, are well and truly over, as are many others. And I'm eternally grateful to my good friends and colleagues at OSDR, ALSIS, and ARU for the partnership that we've developed over the years. Um, they've allowed us to dig much deeper into the complex socioeconomic, political, environmental processes that are at work and really understand the, the different factors that influence cultivation and how they vary by time, location, and socioeconomic group. There is nothing that can supplement the kind of imagery work that we have available these days. It is just incredibly helpful when you have problems of access, etc. So, um, finally, I'm not, I, w I just want to be clear here also that I'm not here claiming to have a monopoly of the truth. There isn't one. I have a perspective. It's based on experience, grounded in coming up to my third decade of fieldwork. Um, and data of, oh, I don't know, uh, well over 10,000 uh, household interviews. There is no more than that. But, uh, yeah. I, with those caveats a, a 
aside, I, I can safely say I am walking proof that there's a thin line between perseverance and stupidity. <laughs> and I crossed it a long, long time ago. So with these duties done, let's, what are we going to talk about this evening? So, no, not that. Clearly, it's going to be opium. I am, alas, the man who's known for, as, as the guy that does opium. It can be really misconstrued. Um, but it is often, I've actually had someone in Diffid one time ring me up and say, are you the guy that does opium? I said, can we really, can we stop talking like that? Um, but I want to talk about what we've learned from the experience of banning opium over these last two decades in Afghanistan. In doing so, I want to talk about the politics of Ga Afghanistan and how power is articulated, particularly in rural areas, because what we see in the implementation of bans in Afghanistan are multiple centers of power, complex bargains between national, subnational, and local actors, as well as international donors and agencies. There are a lot of people at play in here. There's a lot of institutional and individual interests at play, and we need to understand more about this. I also want to touch on what these bans and how they're described in the media, academia, and by officials tell us about how we as scholars, academics, policymakers, and journalists work in Afghanistan. How we do research, how we verify findings, how we come to better understand the country and its different centers of power. And in particular, I want to offer a warning not to overlook the agency of rural communities and their constituent parts, to not just accept the narratives of the powerful, but to hear the voices of community members who are often not the passive recipients of violence that some might suggest, but active participants whose actions can have profound effects on stability and political settlements, and not just locally, but also ripple all the way back to Kabul. And I think this is, this is where the literature, I often felt, lets as many of us down. These kind of explanations of the Hadji who told us, I can ban poppy, I'll do it tomorrow. Not actually thinking behind what actually, and maybe he did do that, but what was actually behind it? How long would it endure? And, and these are the, the, some of the, the critical ele elements around how we work in Afghanistan and what it is to do research in Afghanistan, <coughs> particularly as it gets more and more challenging. Now, this is imagery. This is poppy probability. Essentially, the probability that poppy will be found in various parts of the country. Purple, bright purple being high probability. So you see the bad geese, the helmen, the, the canon, the lower district in the north. So there are a variety of areas. 2016, this is the centers of poppy cultivation, where you're most likely to find it. So what do we learn from banning poppy? First, it's quite clear. It is possible, it is possible to ban poppy. And you can do it in a very short period of time with the right degree of coercion, a lot of bargaining, and deal making at the international, national, subnational, and local level, a ban can be imposed on a population that will result in a dramatic reduction across a relatively wide geographic area. We know this. The Taliban did it. Great effect in 2000, 2001, where cultivation just dropped out of the sky. We also saw it in 2016 with Daesh and some of the upper parts of Achin, Debala, and Kot, where they gained traction. And I can show you some of the, it's a bit of Hogiani poppy, looking good, uh, there too. The wheat is the more even crop, poppy is a little lighter green. So, Nangal, you can see the bands that have taken place. Taliban ban, Hajj bin Mohammed, the lowest thing there. And the downtown here is also a function of Daesh. So we have a number of these bands. I'm using both sets of stats. There is UNODC stats, but there is also US government stats. We debate over which of the more accurate, but I don't think you can actually discuss poppy cultivation in Afghanistan without looking at the disaggregated data and who's produced it and understanding the methodological issues around it. In some provinces, you see they, they map each other quite well. In others, completely contrasting figures, completely. Kandahar, they're like that, cross each other. UN, US is reporting they're coming down, UN's reporting they're going up. You really need to dig deeper. You can't just accept the figures that you see. So, <coughs> I think what's less clear, we know we can ban poppy, we can ban it quickly, but what's less clear is under what conditions does a ban endure? 
And what are the implications of imposing a ban where those conditions are not in place? It's here that the repeated fieldwork in Nangarhan and Helmand has been invaluable. In terms of enduring reductions, the Taliban ban offers little. They were, after all, fell within a single season. It's not possible to assess whether they could have sustained the ban into a second consecutive season, although there are a number of thoughts about this. I, myself, am of the view that the cracks were all be already beginning to show. I was part of the Taliban ban assessment mission. So we were, the donors were dragged into the country to verify that poppy wasn't there. And we went to various parts of the country, Nangar, Helmand, Kandahar, and looked and, nope, I can safely say there's no poppy here. <coughs> and we were interviewing farmers and looking at the processes of how it was imposed and subsequently what consequences were, how they were manifesting at the local level. I thought what we saw was something that suggested severe fragilities in the Taliban regime and the history and nature of the Afghan state, the way the ban was imposed in particular areas, particularly up in the southern districts of, of, of uh, Nangar in places like Ashwood. There was some se real signs that this was not going to last. I'm also of, of the view that the Taliban ban in 2000-2001 is the most misunderstood period of contemporary Afghan history. That has not only led to counterproductive policy when it comes to drugs, but also impacted on how we understand politics and power in rural Afghanistan. But perhaps we can talk about that a bit later. In developing a better understanding of the lessons from banning opium over the last few decades, it's important to break from the habit of seeing things in terms of admin administrative boundaries and analyzing provincial level statistics for provinces like Nangar and Helmand. You have to disaggregate. In particular, we need to distinguish between areas where the state is stronger, i.e. where there is a history of state presence, social contract, where the state has imposed taxes, conscription, and extracted rent on agricultural surpluses. And where economic opportunities for the population exist, these opportunities are actually realized and not just potential. These are the more accessible lower areas, the valleys where the population has better resource endowments, it has access to labor and commodity markets, and here we find local elites whose interests coincide with the national and provincial elite. These are patrons who have successfully concentrated economic and political power and use their considerable influence over rural communities to implement a ban. Now, you can think of the Khans of Mamand and, the, and of Kama or the Asala family in Sukhrod. These are people who have been instrumental in helping these bans be imposed. They control economic and political power and they have access to government positions. These are quite distinct from areas where the state power is limited, where there is no tradition of any notable state presence. These are areas where power is decentered and negotiated, where there are not hierarchical rural elites, not patrons, but brokers and where the state has typically sought to manage dissent rather than govern directly. Completely different kinds of space. And when we look at the experience of opium bans in the terms of this diverse political topography, rather than through the prism of provincial boundaries, we see quite different responses according to the different histories, social structures, and resource endowments within these communities. And this tells us how different populations would cope with the ban on poverty. So, if you look at that in a disaggregated term, We've got a set of districts in Nangarhar, some of which you've seen these massive increases in poppy cultivation over the last few years, according to UNODC, and others' cultivation is still very low levels. Completely different responses. So, in terms of success, we see areas like Sukhrod and Kama. Basud <laughs> were initial responses to the ban imposed by Hajjuddin Mohammed in. 2005, sorry, I don't have 2005 there. I'll go on to that bit later. Um, where we saw in those areas, people basically abandoned poppy in 2005 through simple crop substitution. They took up onion in Sukhrud, green bean in Kama, and that was followed by extensive crop diversification. Helped by road building, work on the Kama intake, and a growing demand for high-value horticulture crops in Kabul and beyond that. We see movements into non-farm income, initially Pakistan, but subsequently jobs in Jalalabad. Um, some are in Kabul, working in construction, and growing number of local employment opportunities. Chemtala camp, it's jobs in the cities of, of, of uh, um, sorry, develop various development programs within the districts themselves. We also saw the security premium delivery of services, education, health, etc. in these areas. I mean, these areas are unrecognisable when you go back to them. We did, until more recently, see some of these processes at work at, in the lower part of the district of Shinwara as well. 
where farmers had in the past typically shifted between opium to wheat when poppy was banned, and then straight back to poppy when the ban was rescinded. But over time, in Xinhua, you see much greater evidence of high-value horse culture, non-farm income, um, and there are other places across the East as well, in, in the Metalands and Kargais of this world. In Lugman, where farmers have been taking full advantage of the returns on gandana, cucumber, lettuce, multiple crops. I mean, it, it's, again, it's the, the differences that we see in these areas over the last 15 years is, is quite astounding. Not just the East, we have Dan Deman, of course, Argandab. I think Argandab, we, we had field work, we did it in 2013 in Argandab. I think it's one of the only places in rural Afghanistan where farmers don't constantly complain. Uh, actually, supportive of the government's provision of, of uh, development inputs. I mean, it is an area where, where you, if you look at the imagery, the place is just awash with pomegranates and grapes. Um, and if actually talk about the, the not area that's not pomegranates and grapes as black land, um, almost unproductive. In Argandab, you see, as I say, you see that. In, in Dand and the Mand, you see these farmers who are incredibly responsive to changing prices of different veg uh, vegetable crops, moving between one and the other. We, see this, we saw the same process as much as everyone talks about the failures of Helmand. We see the same processes in Helmand. If you look at the crop diversification in Alashtagar, it's just incredible over the years, uh, 2009 to 2012. Um, this is not to say that all farmers in these areas absorb the impact, prohibition, uh, the impact of prohibition very easily. We did see collect we didn't, but we didn't see collective economic insecurity and widespread acts of resistance in these areas. There's often this talk as if eradication or a ban on opium immediately results in violence and resistance to the state. In some cases, that, that resistance to the state is actually about negotiation. It's actually about trying to access greater amounts of development assistance and new roads and some further projects, um, and isn't actually about trying to overthrow the state. So where we have seen that, we need to look at it in different terms. But what we do see, what distinguishes the farmers who have moved out of opium almost seamlessly is, one, they have larger land holdings, typically fewer dependents within the household. Two, they have access to non-farm income. It's the range, these great three three-wheeled, they've sort of revolutionised the Afghan countryside, the Zaranj, the ability to move between A and B as a consequence of these three-wheeled three, three uh, motorbikes that you can transport customers or, or your produce in. You have one of those, you can earn 500 Pakistani rupees a day moving between the farm gate and the, uh, and the, and the city. A shop, a wage, all sorts of non-farm incomes that have actually been critical to help people move out of uh, poppy. Sometimes a salary from the police or the army. The farmers who have made that move seamlessly also show much greater levels of crop diversification. They're growing short maturation crops, green vegetables, intercropping sometimes four crops on one unit of land. Again, this idea that we compare poppy with wheat. Um, one's grown for food, the other one's grown for sale. Um, and actually we should be comparing not just the unit of land uh, with two crops, a crop by crop comparison. But if I can grow four units of four crops on a unit of land as a consequence of short maturation periods and winter cropping, why are we making this false comparison between the wheat and poppy in the way that the UN is doing? It's, it's an erroneous comparison. It's misleading. It leads to the Hellman Food Zone and, and the attempt to replace poppy by wheat. So <coughs> these other farmers also have other assets that can be sold which has allowed them to invest in other income streams. I have a number of long-term contacts who have invested their ill-gotten gains from opium in, in buying certain shops. Uh, one, there's, a, there's an ice cream sailor in Goreshk who did very well out of opium, thank you very much, and decided to start a new shop with that. And, and has, again, made the move out of opium quite seamlessly as a consequence of that asset that he had to sell. <laughs> the challenge is that in some of these, in the same provinces where we see reductions in cultivation without widespread economic hardship, we also see stark evidence of failure of households who are not resilient to a ban on poppy and the other shocks that they experience alongside. These are the areas where the Afghan state has not concentrated the means of violence and has no history of doing so, and where viable alternatives to poppy are just not in place. These are areas like the Sangar Valley in, in Alangar in Lagman or in Nangar. It's much of the southern districts bordering Pakistan where land holdings are small, population densities are high, and little crop diversification is taking place. Farmers essentially replace poppy with wheat. But these households can't meet 
their basic needs through wheat cultivation. They just can't grow enough wheat on the amount of land they have for the population densities they have to feed themselves. So when wheat prices go up, they actually end up with a more expensive wheat deficit. And this is something I tried to explain to a number of people. I'm sure others have done the same. And it just doesn't go through. This comparison between wheat and poppy just continues to plague us all. So what we saw in those kind of areas were people joining the Afghan National Army. But for many, it was conscription by default. I mean, I have families that we've done longitudinal research with. Some people call it stalking. Let's call it longitudinal research. And they've got four sons who have joined the army year on year. And they, they're not, not a sign of, uh, of nationalism or patriotism or anything. This, is, this was a sign of the fact that the family couldn't survive without the income that it brought. They recognized the risks it brought of sending sons down south. And when the bodies started coming back, that's when they really started to turn in terms of their view of the government. So <coughs> in these areas, in these areas, bans have not played out well in terms of support for the government. For example, in the southern districts of Nangarhar, except in those areas where Daesh has now penetrated, it is now not unusual for households to have one or more son in the ANSF. He can't come home. You can send the remittances, but he can't come and visit unless he comes under disguise. Another son or cousin in the Taliban may have a brother working as a teacher and receiving a salary from the government. A family members using the government clinic and school. Uh, in fact, school attendance has gone up in some of these areas because the Taliban insist the teachers turn up, and some of the pupils as well. They're growing poppy. And where the household also provides some sort of tax payment, chandal, usha, or whatever, to the Taliban at the local mosque, um, along with other payments depending on their financial status and their connections, of course, and negotiation is everything on these things. Um, so you have these incredibly complex hybrid regimes where communities take services from the state, some of them which are improving as a consequence of Taliban presence, but they grow poppy. And they're welcoming the Taliban, who after all aren't from the sky, they're the local community members, because they allow them to grow poppy. The return to, wa to widespread poppy cultivation in Nangal was not overnight, and I can show that. That's 07. The ban came in, Gulaga Shirzai. Then slowly it starts to creep back initially in the southern district. You see it in Shazad there and Horiani. Comes down into action in 11, 12, and by 13, we're crossing to Chapahar and Radar. And by 2013, we saw opium openly traded in Shadal Bazaar again, which we hadn't seen since 2007. That's in Achin. We saw the return of Salam, the advanced payments on opium and real signs that the opium poppy was here to stay. And whereas the provincial, uh, the provincial authorities had been in a position to impose a ban on opium or eradicate it in the past, by 2013, there was no capacity to impose a ban and no appetite due to the growing insecurity in the, in the southern districts. And this was often put down by uh, policymakers as showing a lack of commitment. It was so disconnected from the realities of what district and provincial authorities and others were having to contend with in these areas. In fact, in 2013, what we saw were the authorities requesting the population to acquiesce and allow some poppy eradication so the authorities didn't look bad. This was not Nangahar of 08, 09, or 10, where the authorities could impose their will. This was a time when the district and provincial authorities, and indeed the ANA, we're going cap in hand to rural communities, asking them to please allow some crops to be destroyed. You're making us look bad in front of the international family. So the politics shifted as a consequence of the economics and other events that were going on in these southern districts. But the ban on poppy was instrumental in changing those politics. Alongside, of course, there was the, the land grab up in Achin and, 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 and Nangaha. So other events were taking place, but it was absolutely instrumental. And I'll show you what eradication looked like in 20... So, so this, is, this is 2012, actually. So these are all the events. You see the sheer number of people who died in the eradication campaign. 47, sorry, 48 killed, most of them in Horiani. It's 2012. 2013, oh, we're not going out there and doing that again. This wasn't about political commitment. This was about fear. This was about control, the fact that the government had lost control of many of these areas. 
and was much more in a, in a position, it wasn't in a position to impose, it was having to, it almost forgotten its own history. Forgotten the fact that in these southern districts, you have to negotiate. You've always managed by dissent. You do not govern directly. They overstepped their reach, and suddenly they find themselves not even being able to go out and eradicate in the southern parts of the war. And this is eradication in 2013. Yeah, take a few heads off, a bit of a game. Yeah, it's not really, we're not really talking about much. So, and then the rise from 2012 is dramatic. Like other bands, um, the population started to realize that the emperor had no clothes. The state was not that powerful. And when you think of Gulag Shazai, the idea of the emperor not having any clothes is really not a pleasant thought. Um, <coughs> but so after being declared poppy free in 2008, poppy went down from, um, from low levels in, in 09, 10, 11, to it was about th just over 3,000 hectares in, in 2012. By 2013, there was over 18,000 hectares of poppy back in Mangal. In 2016, cultivation was about 14,500 hectares. That's only because of the Taliban ban in Nazian Khot and Achin. And if you look at this one, this is poppy probability across the southern districts. So if you look here, you couldn't find poppy. Very little. And this was, for whatever reasons, I mean, there are some various suppositions, um, but Matthias had actually banned poppy. The green was primarily any government influenced areas, let's not call it control, where again there was no poppy. And what we've seen is this trickle back of poppy cultivation. This is Hogiani, the district centre of Hogiani. And if you look, here's the district centre, the odd field away from the road, away from the main centre, but it's already coming back in 2015. 2015, right next to the roadside, <laughs> you can't miss it. Again, the inability of the government to control, and this is lower down, nearer the road, but this is in, in Shinwa, not that far from Rano Pass, and as the military bases close, poppy starts to spring back. This is almost like a, a two-year lag from the, from the previous Hogiani period. And no doubt this year we're going to see a lot more poppy than ever. And if you zoom in here, you might be able to see it. Uniform colour, but you see a bit more of the pastel patterns in Diakistan. So, this year, 2017, poppy is moving further down the valleys into lower parts of Shinwa. Uh, it's in Batikot on government, so-called government land. It's found across Chapao and Upper Sukhurud and even into parts of Lower Sukhurud along the foothills of the Torgar Mountains and no doubt around Sultanpur this year. So, a lot more poppy coming in Nangaha. Um, and all the ba although the ban on poppy in Daesh areas is thought to be holding, um, something very particular about that. So discuss that in Q and A, but um, and I'd be very interested in other people's views on it, particularly some of the old Afghan hands that are here, um, because it really is quite distinct from any other thing, any of these other bands that I'm talking about. In Helmand, there are similar areas where we see we saw little agricultural diversification as well, and a high dependency on poppy that led to growing political discontent and a pushback into opium. Particularly after 2014, when the ALP began to look at ways to manage the security situation in the Canal Command area, conscious that they didn't have the backup that they used to have, and maybe the fact that they had to start doing deals. If you look at the probability in Helmand, which has also had its ups and downs, and you can see some, again, the difference between US and UN figures are really quite stark in some years. Um, so, again, very careful about correlating shifts in poppy cultivation with any, any kind of events. So this is poppy probability, Helmand, 2008. Places are wash, high, high poppy probability. There are, there's places to watch out for. Not in this, I wasn't allowed a pointer. I think they, they thought I might hurt myself or you with it. So. Um, so you've got central Helmand. You've got this area north of the Bogra Canal. Look at this area, Farah, which is Bakwa. Um, and Delaren, and then these areas up here. Now, if you move along, you can see in 2009, 
the effect of the, the Helmand food zone starts to take place here. Start to see it thinning into um, Noah Barak Zai and Dan Seer. You can see Farah starting to grow, but also these areas, massive increases in, in the amount of land under agriculture in these areas. For 2012, this is all thinned out still. And then 14 by 15, massive increase in Farah here. Look, the amount of land under agriculture. Thanks. By 2016, it's grown. But this area north of the Bogra is increased. I'll show that a bit better with the next, next slide. But so we saw rising cultivation um, in Elmond, particularly in the former desert areas, just north of the Bogra Canal here, just here, but also into Bakwa and Nimroz here. An area where the Afghan state has limited access and where until recently there was very little land under agricultural production at all. It was simply desert land. 10, 15 years ago. Let me just show that, actually. So this, this shows the expansion over time. Just that area north of the Bogra Canal. It's an interesting process. It just keeps growing. Um, it has this odd dip every now and then. But this was desert. There was nothing there. The question is, what drove the increase in this desert? Yeah, price, we always go on about price when it comes to opium. It remains attractive, just um, it keeps, yeah, it's, the price is a good this year again. Uh, but, yeah, it's not, it's, it's part of the reason. Success in the canal command area, the Helmand food zone, the classic balloon effect, you squeeze in one place and it expands in another. And then, of course, insecurity, the, this, this constant attempt to infer a causal relationship between Taliban presence and Pakistan. Um, and as if the Taliban leads to the poppy as opposed to the ban on poppy leads to the Taliban that leads to the return of poppy. I mean, the, these are complex relationships around the relationship between insecurity and poppy. It's often, uh, it's often too simply put. Let's come back to the first two points. So the balloon effect stipulates that where there is a given demand, you squeeze supply, one area it simply moves to another. We can see, clearly see this at work in Helmand, but it's not just the movement of poppy. It was the movement of people. A large number of people. I'm, I, my back of the cigarette packet um, estimate of the sheer number of people who are living in these desert spaces. We've seen 300,000 hectare increase in, in land under agriculture in the desert of southwest Afghanistan alone. Tell me a development project that achieves that kind of expansion in agricultural land. Work it out based on the interviews that we have in both Bakwa and Helmand over many years. You're probably talking about 1.2 1 1 .2 million people who are living in these former desert areas. So we've got a movement of people. Um, this was a, you know, we shouldn't just attribute that to the Helmand food zone. This was a process already at work since 2002, but with the imposition of the ban in the food zone, it increased. And, and what detailed field work both north and south of the Nari Bogra showed is that when landowners in the canal area moved from poppy to a, sh a cropping system that was primarily based on wheat in the winter, plus a bit of cotton, melon, watermelon in the spring, followed by maize and mung bean in the summer, in the summer, incomes fell significantly. For the landowner with 10 dreams of land or less, he was on about dollar, dollar gross income per person per day in that family. For a sharecropper, they would be on about 20 cents per person per day. They were looking at one fifth of the total yield of lower value crops compared to one third of the yield when they cultivated poppy. There were clear signs of economic stress in uh, distress in the Canal Command area in places like Western Nadi Alley and Marja, but particularly in the former desert areas within the canal, because some of the areas under the canal aren't irrigated by the canal, if you forgive my terminology. Um, various Dashti Ainak or Dashti Sheshirak and these places. Loss of opium led to the loss of irrigation um, because they couldn't afford to run their sheep wells. That meant less drinking water, less water for their livestock, um, and significant economic problems. So the movement from poppy to wheat, um, cotton, maize, mung bean, if you like, as a livelihood system, led to a reduction in the, in the opportunities for the land poor, created a mobile labor force skilled in growing poppy. And anyone who's stood in a poppy field and tried to give it a go um, should know that it is quite challenging. 
And this was foreseeable for anyone who cared to look or listen. Why is this the case? Um, well, if there's no poppy being grown in the canal, there's no need for land landowners to employ elders to work their land. We have to look at the symbiotic relationships between landed and landless when it comes to open poppy. This is an incredibly labor-intensive crop. If Anthony is growing poppy, he needs my help if he's growing a certain amount, uh, above a certain level of poppy. I work as a sharecropper on his land. He's happy for my help. I'm happy for the land. I'm happy, happy for the, the water it brings. I can feed my family because I have some wheat, some poppy. Suddenly, Anthony decides, no, I'm out. I have to go and find somewhere else for a house, for water, for land. So I move north into the desert. And of course, I, as the landless, was least likely to get any development assistance anyway. Most of the Helm and Food Zone efforts were targeted at the landed. This is the result is the land poor were dispossessed by the removal of poppy, and they headed north. Where they had access, some capital, they leased land from those that, um, that purchased it or had taken it already. Where they did not, they share cropped the land for only a quarter of the crop. So they went from a third of the crop in the canal area to a quarter and even a fifth in the desert areas with lower yields. The result was, I'll show you what the result was, um, massive extension in the amount of, oh, no, it's our own tree that didn't break this because it didn't have it. Monocropping poppy. 2010, 2011, 2012, people would use monocrop poppy to make up for the losses that they'd incurred. But you had a cheap labor force, highly available, uh, skilled, and they just monocropped the crop. So we saw a massive uptake there. Um, so that's why we saw this massive expansion into these desert areas. And then this, this expansion of the poppy crop. So what did we actually achieve, achieve from that Hellman food zone? It's also to no important to note that there's been some dramatic improvements in agricultural techniques in these areas, showing that agriculture is neither time-bound and that there is a real dyna dynamism within these farming communities and those that service them. First, we saw the move, as I showed, to eat well. And this is... Uh, Knowledge that is allegedly was transferred from NGOs and deep well technology coming in from Pakistan. Uh, this is how people claim it. We interviewed a number of these guys who run these rigs. Um, and this has made this area um, possible to grow agriculture in it. We've also had herbicides. After about 16 years of doing field work, we suddenly started to see, I, we suddenly started to see this. I mean, you've got paraquat from Iran. You've got paraquat from China, broad-based herbicides. They then started to move into topic, which is specific. Suddenly, I can grow more poppy because I don't have to weed as much. It's much easier now. Of course, you don't wear any protective gear. That would be for softies. You just spray it. Um, the environmental health consequences of this, we don't know. Now, and I think this is fascinating, now we have herbicides that actually advertise for poppy. <laughs> so, you know, these, don't know, these farmers are all time back. It's traditional agriculture. It's, you know, we've got this dynamism here in terms of the commercial developments that are taking place. I, I really need to find out where these labels are designed, where they're put on. I also want to find out, can you just take those in mind and I've got to put some copyright up and check them. <laughs> but I, I'm collecting these labels at the moment. So The other thing that we've seen is solar-powered tea beds. This is the reservoir. I thought everyone was starting to practice for the Olympics or something because everyone seemed to have these 600 meter or 1,000 square meter swimming pools. Um, they're about a meter to two meters deep. They're not lined. There's a big evaporation problem. So people basically you have these irrigating poppy or irrigating the crop, let's put it like that. And we went from one in one of our locations in 13-14 to 81 by 2016. In a 300 by 300 kilometer block in a year and a half, there is now 13,000 of these. But no, no, agriculture is time bound. It doesn't change. It's traditional farming. Uh, this isn't Mr. Big. This isn't the Taliban or, or some sort of uh, um, Tony Soprano. This is farmers learning, watching each other, learning to use new techniques. 
Clearly, this uptake in solar raises serious questions about the long-term sustainability of agriculture and the settlements in these former desert areas. And we'll find we're doing some more work with AAU this year. So, we turn to the, so to return to the question as to what drove the increase in, in Bogra, north of the Bogra. Price, yep. Success in the canal command area, yep. Food zone, classic balloon effect. Um, but also, let's go back to that question of insecurity. Here the argument has been that where we have a strong state, we don't have illicit property. The UK, the US, I don't know, Belgium. Um, but it's not the same to say that where we don't have poppy, we have a strong state, <laughs> governor, or indeed a strong head of the PRT, or a regional command, NATO. Many careers have been linked to low levels of poppy in the last decade, and so many of these are just shows of strength. For example, in Nangar and Helmand, where the ban pushed into areas where the state hasn't concentrated the means of violence and where viable alternatives don't exist. The process of banning poppy undermined the legitimacy of the state. It relied on deals with the rural elite and population as well as promises of development assistance that have rarely been delivered on. It also required the threat of or perceived threat of foreign military power. You just look at what happened in Nangar with Gulag Sherzai conflating coin and CN in 2007-8 and the significant uptake in US military forces in the, in the run up to that period. You look at Helmand, with the reductions in the Canal Command area have actually been achieved without the surge. Now Zai, 2009 and 10. Marja, where poppy fell from 60% of land in 2010 to less than 5% in 2011. I won't show you that. All right, let me show you, that's Marja, right? 2008, 2009, a lot of poppy, 2010, oh, here we go. No eradication there beforehand. That was 14,000 Marines. So that, so you know, I think we really need to understand this because so often outsiders see the appearance, uh, see the absence of poppy as a sign of strength. It sees it as the projection of power, of state power in remote and peripheral areas. But locally, the population is aware of a process of negotiation the threat of foreign military action that creates the perception that the Afghan state is weak. We see it as strength locally. They say, who are these guys? They used to say about Golaga Sherzai, who is he? He used to drive to our, our village. Now he needs an American helicopter. <laughs> who is this man? He's Afghan. He behaves like an American. It's important to recognize that in the southern districts of Nangar, the ban did nothing to aid the legitimacy of the Afghan state and Gulag Sherzai, or indeed the rural elite, that was seen to have facilitated the imposition of the ban. Some of those like Malik Usman and Malik Niaz in Aching, who were instrumental in imposing the ban, couldn't even travel back to their, dis their villages by 2013. They were unwelcome, and their, ri and their rivals actually took power. In Helmand, the vitriol and profanities used to describe Governor Mango and his successor Baluch were extreme and certainly not to be repeated promptly. Uh, in fact, it became increasingly apparent in places like Marja, Western Nadi Ali, and in the former desert areas south of Nari Bogra and the north of the canal, that the state was an entity that was perceived as taking from communities, exposed households to shock, and this, like in Nangar, increased support for anyone that would oppose the authority. So, in summary, and I will be quick, what can we conclude from the lessons of banning poppy? First, they point to avoiding go-it-alone CN initiatives. Eradication, coercion, not to plant, single sector alternative development efforts that might work in isolation of the wider development, security and governance effort operating in an area. Many of these efforts actually undermine um, many of the other projects that are taking place. Second, it also means acknowledging that the impact of drugs on the political economy of Afghanistan and understanding how it impacts on the priorities that have been set in terms of security, development and governance. We have to stop pretending, forgive my metaphor, um, that there isn't a bull in the China shop being ridden by a thousand pound gorilla. The, the failure to discuss drugs in today's Afghanistan is just shocking. The unwillingness to even reference it is, is myopic beyond belief. Indeed, um, the lessons suggest we need to move beyond the point of rhetoric of recognizing drugs as a cross-cutting issue and actively doing something about it. It points to the integration of the drugs issue into the wider planning process, the kind of work the World Bank's done on its agricultural strategy review, 
um, and certainly adopting a principle of not making things worse. Um, considering how development interventions might facilitate an increase in cultivation and looking at ways to counter this. I mean, I have seen so many projects, including the Good Performance Initiative, invest in, in irrigation systems. Y we are rewarding you for growing poppies. Here is an irrigation system. Oh, two years later, there's more land under agriculture, there's more poppy, and it's higher yielding. Perfect, wonderful. Um, we really need to think beyond that, don't we? It also involves building an understanding of the illicit economy in the political analysis of Afghanistan. In the same way you can't ignore economy, an economy that creates 400,000 direct jobs, the opium economy creates more jobs than the ANSF that we care so much about. It's the, most Im the opium is the most valuable export in Afghanistan, by far. But we pretend it's not there. You can't ignore that effect on the economy, but you can't also ignore its effect on political its settlements and its effort to end the conflict. All these discussions that we have about the political entities and how does this all take place with such widespread cultivation and its widespread trade in this commodity? Third, moves, it points to, these lessons point to moving towards area-based planning where the causes of cultivation, how they differ by different socioeconomic group are understood, integrated into design and implementation. So we don't see five different projects operating in a square kilometre, all working with the different agendas and actually undermining each other. Wouldn't that be interesting, the idea? Um, fourth, these lessons point to capacity building in Afghan institutions and, they, dare I say, our own offices in country. So often we face a UNODC with a limited development capacity um, and a development community with no understanding of the drug use. Yet they're working in those areas. With the best will in the world, our own colleagues in embassies and bilateral missions lack experience in both the subject of illicit economies and Afghanistan, making it hard for them to support Afghan colleagues or undertake effective, effective planning in bilateral and multilateral programs. I say that as someone who's done a lot of work and uh, I've had some excellent colleagues over the years, but I've also had some incredibly indifferent ones. Finally, the lessons from banning poppy point towards actually developing a systematic process of technical review. Ensure that existing and planned programs are examined and supported so that lessons, lear lessons learned are applied and actually adopted. Not just witnessed and talked about in meetings. God forbid more meetings on lessons learned that are more about legacy than actually learning. Lessons, these lessons also mean building effective impact monitoring systems so that programs are able to adapt to the change in terrain and build robust evidence as to what are the intended and unintended outcomes, both CNN development of these future objects. I've seen many of an m &E system up close and personal, from the Helmand Monitoring and Evaluation Project to the independent monitoring agencies of various programs. And I can safely say they're designed to provide good news. They're not diagnostics. They're not designed to understand what is actually happening on the ground. And this leaves the Afghan government donors and programs blind unable to make the necessary adjustments in delivery where if things are in fact going wrong or replicate what is going right. And on that, I'll call it a day, although I do have a nice little video for you if you have the time a bit later. Thank you.